my time and uh, work towards understanding an injury that really is a complex injury. Uh, most of you guys know my own story. Uh, for a long time, I had no idea what was going on with me when I had all these concussions. So uh, I just dedicated a lot of time and effort towards just really getting up to take a big picture of what's been going on. All traumatic brain injuries are an inherent risk of contact sports, and yet they have continually been misunderstood or regarded as a sign of weakness and the integrity of an athlete. All who are involved in such activities must be educated on the signs, symptoms, and risks of repetitive head injuries in order to ensure the safety of our athletes through proper management and diagnostic skills. So here's my own personal story. John Gennady is 6 foot, 210 pounds, uh, number 58 offensive line, defensive line. Uh, sophomore year, we had a new coaching staff come in. Looked like a new opportunity for me to really get some time to play. So I busted my butt off every single day throughout the summer and into training camp. Now during two days during our camp that was here, I suffered from a mild concussion. And I didn't know what went on. I just know I got knocked out and went right back to the huddle. And the coach told me to go get checked out. And they told me I had a mild concussion. They told me to wait seven days to be reevaluated. And I only waited six. And I went away to three days being the young, unknowledgeable sophomore that I was and told the coach, I'm good, I don't have any headaches, let me play. And he, let, he let me play. And by the third practice at night, I was on my way to a hospital. And the doctors believed that I was suffering from what was called second impact syndrome, which is something I'll get into later. Um, but yeah, and they terminated me for the rest of the season. I had to sit out for the entire season. Um, and really got to see what it was like to be an injured kid. Um, even at camp, the injured players had to sit at their own lunch table. I couldn't sit with my friends. I had to sit with the other kids who had concussions or were injured or anything else. And for so long, I wondered what happened to me and why did this happen? And the first thing I could come to was the culture of contact sports. Now, this quote, pain is weakness leaving the body. I, I first noticed this quote watching a Florida Gators game during football season. It was hanging in the locker room. And I can see how it can be a good motivational tool, but at the same time, I don't see much logic behind it. Now, the, the culture of contact sports is really involved to one where players become numbers rather than human beings, especially in football, which is what this project is primarily focused on. And the, just the culture of the game, there's, there's a relationship between coaches and athletic trainers, and the players mixed in with that too, that really isn't a very functional relationship. You have coaches wanting the players out there, because they want to win. You have trainers that want their players off the field when they're hurt because they want them to be safe, and then you have the players who all they want to do is just play. And that ultimately leads to a lot of injuries. That ultimately leads to coaches telling their players to play through injuries. And they always say, coaches will always tell you, there's a clear difference between being hurt and injured. And it's very rarely that we stop to think about what really makes us think. Now, the brain is largely the most complex organ in the human body. It's the foundation of all our thoughts. And it's the location where all of our thoughts, behaviors, uh, etc., are located. Um, the, the brain is made up of thousands and thousands of neurons, which are the basic working units of the brain, and they're very, they're uh, responsible for the transmission of information. Now, neurons they serve as like a, a, a roadmap of interconnected highways throughout the entire brain, and what they do is they all have different tasks, and they're all sent fire off neurotransmitters to transmit this information. And that's made possible through what's called nerve impulses, which is where uh, potassium ions, calcium ions, they are fired across ion channels, and that's when uh, information is transmitted, which is enabled by action potential, which allows it to be transmitted at an over overwhelmingly large and quick rate. And when you get into neurotransmitters, they are the brain's chemical messengers. Now, neurotransmitters, they uh, they're fired on by neurons. They perform a lot of different tasks. The neurotransmitters are responsible for the firing of other neurotransmitters. They're responsible for tightening of muscles. They're responsible for your thoughts. They're responsible for many things that go on throughout the human body. So right now I'm going to get into my class activity before I get all the way into what a concussion is. And it's pretty much what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be reading you a couple statistics about concussions. And all you have to do is raise your hand and tell me whether you think the statistic is over or under what I say it is. So the first one is, one in every 20 high school football players will suffer from a concussion. Does anyone want to guess if it was over or under that? Over. It is under. It's one in every 15 will suffer a concussion playing football. And the next one, nearly 45% of professional football players fail to report concussion symptoms. Anyone have a guess? Over. It's actually under. 20% fail to 
report their concussion symptoms, which is surprising. And you see a difference in that in, at the high school level. 85 to 100 concussions occur per regular season in the NFL. Anyone? Yes, 120 to 130 concussions are reported in every NFL season. It's just about, on average, one report in every other game. And here's another one. Since 1997, there have been about 25 cases of head-related fatalities or severe neurological impairments in football in the United States. Matt? Over. It is over. It's been over 50 cases of kids either dying or having severe brain damage. Uh, here's another one. It's estimated that 4,400,000 4, sport-related concussion occur every year. Anyone have a guess? Over on the show. Under? Yes, 300,000 occur just about every year in the United States. Ten days is the standard period of rest before reevaluation after suffering a concussion. Chris? Under? Yes, it's seven days. Like I said, I only waited six and look how my career turned out. Uh, one study has shown that in season concussions occur within ten days of the initial injury 55% of the time. George Pilber? Yeah, 92% of the time a recurrent injury in the same season occurs within that time frame. And the first hard shell plastic helmet was introduced in 1917, but wasn't introduced in the NCAA until 1922, only five years later. Anyone think that was over or under? Jeff? Under? No, it was actually 22, year, 22 years later, in 1939, that they actually require helmets. And 65% uh, of brain injuries are considered mild. Under? Actually, over 85% are considered mild. And here's the final one. Concussion rates in sports have lessened in the past decade. Yeah, they've nearly doubled in the last 10 years. So, that's just to set the mood for the statistics with the concussion crisis in football. Now I'm going to get into what concussion really is. So what is concussion? It's a mild traumatic brain injury. It's clinically considered an alteration in brain functioning brought on by a trauma to the head, which may or may not result in a loss of consciousness. Uh, a concussion is often referred to as one getting their bell rung or one getting dinged, and that's often a scary path to follow down when you minimize the significance of an, a brain injury, because that's what happens. You, you think that it's nothing, you think it's just a headache, you get back out there, next thing you know you're in a hospital bed, or you're not playing for the rest of the season. I know what it feels like. So the features of, features of concussion, how do you know if someone has a concussion? Well, the first one, you got a vacant stare, delayed verbal and motor responses, disorientation, Confusion and inability to focus attention. Incoordination. Slurred and incoherent speech. Emotions out of proportion. Memory deficits. And any period of unconsciousness. Now, again, you're not required to be unconscious to have a concussion. You can be completely aware and still have the injury. Now, with the symptoms, you have early symptoms which are experienced early on. Right, right when you get the impact, you, you start feeling these things. And the early symptoms that occur within at least five to ten minutes of the initial hit or a headache, dizziness, lack of awareness of surroundings, and nausea or vomiting. Now late symptoms, they may take days to about a week or a week and a half to develop and they could be prolonged symptoms which could be a sign of post-concussion syndrome which I might get into later. And late symptoms, they include low-grade headaches, lightheadedness, poor attention and concentration, memory dysfunction, easy fatigability, irritability and low frustration tolerance, intolerance of bright lights or difficulty focusing vision, intolerance of loud noises, anxiety or a depressed mood, and sleep disturbance. So that's, that's about the basic features and symptoms of a concussion. Now I'll get into the biological part of what goes on during a concussion. What it says on this slide right here is that during a concussion the brain develops inabilities in regulating blood supply and making energy. Now what happens during a concussion, well, first of all, I'm going to draw it for you just so you get an idea. It's kind of complicated, but it'll be simple in the end, hopefully. What happens is potassium ions, they rush out of the cell, and calcium ions, they flood the cell, which slowly eats away the cell. Now, during this, this process requires glucose, which is energy. And when you have glucose coming in, it overexcites over the cells and ultimately cuts off blood supply to that area of the brain. And now that's what's called cerebral ischemia. Now cerebral ischemia, that's just, again, that's when the, uh, the brain lacks the ability to get blood supply to that part of the brain. Now as this is going on, 
you have what you have neurotransmitters, they bind onto the receptors of the neurons and they change the receptors. And these receptors are susceptible to an uh, excitatory compound called glutamate, which I'll just label as X. And this compound excites cells so much that the cell suffers from excitotoxic death and dies. Now that's just on the small scale of everything. That's just one neuron. You, you could have hundreds, you could have thousands of neurons dying during uh, a concussion, especially if you're suffering from repetitive head injuries. Now damage to that area of the brain will always remain permanent. However, the brain has the ability, or what is known as plasticity, to pick up for other regions of the brain that have been injured. The brain is a very complex organ, and it, again, it'll be able to pick up the slack in some regions of the brain, but eventually that, that ability is going to run out. Now I'm going to get into a quote right now. This is going to introduce me, me really stepping into the diseases, the disorders, and the conditions that can develop through repetitive head injuries. And this is a quote from Harry Carson. I'm actually going to show you a video. Uh, Harry Carson, he is an NFL Hall of Fame linebacker. He played for the New York Giants. And his generation of football play, retired football players are actually uh, popularly known for being suffering from neurological impairments because of their playing careers. And the NFL is largely ignored until recent past. The, uh, any implications of having any involvement with such injuries? There's no correlation between what happened to them in playing And people can call me anything they want. They can call me a malcontent, a baby, call me whatever you want to call me. But nobody's going to shut me up from talking about what I know. And I'll do whatever I have to do to help these guys. Now, that quote, I mean, I was watching an ESPN Outside the Lines special on head injuries in the, in the NFL. And it kind of reminded me of myself in a way. Because for a long time, I dealt with a lot of criticism from my teammates, from my coaches, from other, player, from other people in the school. That I was faking it, that I was full of crap, that I really wasn't hurt. But I was. And just from all the research I've been doing, I've seen and read stories that are a lot worse than what happened to me. Uh, you have kids that can't even go to the proms anymore. You have kids who can't even speak to their parents anymore. You have kids that aren't even alive anymore. So I conserved myself well. Now, post-concussion syndrome, it's one of the most basic, most common results from a mild traumatic brain injury. The condition may take days, weeks, or even months, and in some cases years, to develop or to recover from. Symptoms include prolonged cases of physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral issues. Now that includes that depression falls into that, uh, inability to remember things falls into that, um, and, and just not being yourself. And for the longest time, I felt like I wasn't myself. For about a year and a half to two years, I wasn't on the same level that I, I always was at. So, I mean, that's, that's basically, typically, I mean, I feel like I had a pretty good case of post-concussion syndrome rather than second impact syndrome. But, and, uh, Post-concussion syndrome, like I said, can develop depression. And what depression is, it's when someone is developing uh, the ability or having persistently sad or empty moods, low energy levels, unusual fatigue, headaches, or unresponsive chronic pain. Now, depression affects the way someone feels about themselves, the way they feel about their environment, and just the making yourself feel like you just can't do anything, you, you, you're worth nothing. And then that's what happens, especially with the culture of football today. You have guys being put down just because they're hurt, because they have a brain injury. You have guys feeling like they gave up on the team, they feel like their teammates are giving up on them. And then you start getting this whole world of different opinions, and you get caught up in that. Now second impacts, and this is what doctors suspected me of having. It's really, essentially what it is, it's the swelling of the brain. And on this slide, I have news, news titles of high school football players dying from second impact syndrome. Now, what happens with second impact syndrome? It's taking a concussion and then suffering from another concussion in a short period of time. And what essentially happens is the brain swells, and you go into brain hemorrhaging, and you require brain surgery, and not everyone comes out of surgery. So what happens when someone has second impacts and this is what happens on the field. The, the 